Great to see you. I spoke with Daniela at the Aspen Ideas Climate Festival in Miami Beach, Florida. Daniela is one of the speakers at the event. Her organization, Sustainable Ocean Alliance, identifies funding for ideas that can keep the oceans healthy. It all started back when I was 12 years old and I was walking home from school and I saw a picture of penguins walking on sand. And this picture was announced in the movie An Inconvenient Truth by Al Gore. So I went home, watched the film, and little did I know that the film was all about climate change. And so you can imagine that as a 12 year old thinking I would be watching a movie about my favorite animal, penguins, I was actually exposed to the reality of climate change. And it was at that moment when I just realized it would be my responsibility to do something about the climate crisis. As a kid, I had no idea what that meant, <laughs> nor did I really consider what a career in solving the climate crisis would look like, but I knew that it was going to be the path it would go on. And then at some point you do end up at the UN and there's a takeaway, which is there's a lot of old folks here, right? I mean, what was, what was, give us the, the story behind that. So Georgetown invited me to be the student representative to attend the UN meeting. And the UN meeting was on the state of our ocean. And so I was chosen because my entry essay to Georgetown was all about solving the climate crisis. And so they knew my passion for it. But what most people don't know is that I didn't necessarily have a, a big ocean passion at the time, rather I had a passion for the climate crisis. And so it was a very educational moment for me as I was sitting there at the UN, surrounded by heads of state, surrounded by CEOs and world leaders, expecting to hear about answers, expecting to hear plans for how we're going to help our ocean and our planet. I was sitting at the edge of my seat the entire time, realizing that not one person got up there and spoke about solutions, not one. Nor did I hear anything about young people being involved. I was the youngest person in the room, to your point. And so I just had my big realization of, number one, we have to get this generation involved, activated. They can't be spectators anymore. They have to be doers, change makers. And number two, we need to stop talking about the problem and focus on the solutions. What blueprint can we bring to the table? Daniela is the founder of a global organization that encourages innovative solutions to sustain the health of the ocean. Sustainable Ocean Alliance has created the world's largest network of young ocean leaders by establishing a presence in more than 165 countries. You've dipped your toe in a couple different worlds, Washington DC being one, uh, the Silicon Valley being another. Talk to us a little bit about your journey. What drew you there and why was it important to go there? And what have you learned your time, spending time in Washington in the Silicon Valley? Because those are obviously centers of power and, and personalities. Absolutely. So in DC, I found that a lot of people talked about legislation and thought in the legislation box. And so when I was talking about SOA, every question I got was, how is the ocean going to change legislation or how are we going to make that happen? Whereas when I was talking to people in Silicon Valley, the conversations were more around entrepreneurship, around how can we build inventive solutions. And so I, I moved from DC after graduation, went to Silicon Valley because I wanted to capture that the mentality of there are no limits. The idea of how can we utilize IoT technology, blockchain, AI, to revolutionize the ocean space. And that's what was missing from the ocean sustainability ecosystem. Every single person kept talking about bringing more marine protected areas to life, which we need, but no one talked about the next generation of technology. How can we disrupt the industries? How can we build new business models and re-engineer economies? And that's what drove me to move to Silicon Valley and just capture the essence, capture the, the, the mentors, the advisors there. And, and it became a very clear path for me going there and, and seeing the, the connection between technology and the ocean. So meeting those kind of like-minded individuals must have been quite a heady experience. I mean, what were some of the things where people would come and say, we can do this or we can do that? What, what were some of the things that kind of jumped out at you? Well, it's so funny because I remember when I was a junior in school at Georgetown, I was watching Shark Tank. And one of the entrepreneurs pitching was called Lollyware. And what Lollyware was doing at the time, they were creating cups out of seaweed. I remember so clearly the shark saying, oh, you know, this is like a party trick. That's not going to go anywhere. And for me, that was the future. I saw it. I saw that how can we take this material, seaweed, 
and replace plastic with it. And so at the time, I remember so clearly saying, I would fund this entrepreneur if I could. And Lobbyware was one of our first entrepreneurs to join our Ocean Accelerator program. And so it was one of those moments in life where I just, I saw that, that vision that I had and the passion for this company come to real life and we became one of their early investors. And now they're creating straws out of seaweed. They're growing, they're scaling, using material science to replace plastic as a material. And I find that just so heartwarming. It gives me chills even to think about the trajectory of me watching them on Shark Tank all the way to me being able to be an investor and a supporter of their work. Sustainable Ocean Alliance supports organizations like Roots of the Sea in planting nurseries and educating youth about the importance of mangroves in the Caribbean island of Martinique. Mangroves can filtrate water, working as a carbon sink and help to prevent erosion of the coastlines. So walk me through the process. I've got this idea. I want to meet with you. I want to get some kind of funding. And you're like, okay, I'm on board. We're, we're going we're gonna to figure out a way to make this happen. How do you get to that point? Sure. So like you said, the first thing is the idea, making sure that you have an idea that is ocean positive. So we look for solutions that are having a positive impact on the ocean. Number two, that they're scalable. So your solution has to be scalable beyond your, your small region or your area where you're located. And number three, you have to have a for-profit business model. So we look for solutions that have the potential to be invested in and, and scale. And so that would be the initial phase of it. We vet those criteria, and then we put you in front of a panel of scientists and experts that can make sure that your, your solution is not going to harm the environment in any way or be of the detriment to the environment. And then you apply, we do a, a vetting process to understand who the founder is, understand your personality, who you are, your motivation, your passion, your values, which are so critical as we're vetting um, these entrepreneurs. And then once you get past those three, I would say, criterias, then we, we look at your business model, your plan, how you, how you plan to build this out, the needs that you have, the mentorship that you need, um, the skills that you're lacking. And we build a, a program around, around you as an entrepreneur and as an um, individual so we can make sure that you have the right leadership coaching, the right training, and the right investment into your company. So you'll be speaking here and you'll be talking about solutions. Talk to us about um, how this came about and you know, give us a little preview of what you're going to be telling the people here this week. So what's really exciting is the fact that we built this mechanism to accelerate solutions. And I never necessarily had a number in mind as to how many solutions the world needed. However, one of our partners and funders, Mark Benioff, um, who's the CEO of Salesforce, he did. And when he funded SOA, he said, Daniela, we should accelerate 100 ocean solutions in two years. And so, as you can imagine at the time, I didn't take that challenge lightly. Rather, I said to my team, let's build the ecosystem to make this a reality. And so, we went out and we looked for grassroots solutions, nonprofit solutions, for profit solutions that we could support, that we could invest in, that we could really take to the next level. And what we uh, were able to announce is that not only did we reach the 100 milestone, we actually supported and accelerated 222 ocean solutions that range from companies that are using wave energy, uh, CalWave, um, companies that are using, like I mentioned, material science to replace plastic, companies that are you know, looking at ways to track and map out the ocean. And so now we have a portfolio of 222 solutions that are going to change the world, frankly. And they're going to disrupt industries that otherwise would continuously harm our planet and our ocean. And that's something to be so proud of and also so, so helpful for. But I think that's, that's the other thing that I find with when I talk to young people about climate is this the sense of urgency. I mean, this is your crisis. Like older people, it's like they may make it and kick the bucket or whatever. This is the problem. It's it. You're facing it. It's going to happen. It's happening now, but it's really going to happen in your lifetime. Is that what you find when you talk to these other entrepreneurs? Is there just kind of this sense of urgency, this driving force? Yes, we don't have to be convinced that climate change is real, nor do we have to be convinced about the urgency in which we need to act. The only thing we need are the resources and the funding and the support we need to make these changes. You know, when I look at, at, at this generation, we're experiencing climate change, and we also know that if we don't make significant changes in our lives, we're going to suffer. 
And what bothers me is the fact that people that are making decisions right now, people in power, they're not going to be around to face these consequences, nor are they giving other people a voice. And so the hope with SOA is how can we empower the youth voice to have a seat at the table? How can we bring this dialogue between people that have experience and young people so we can have intergenerational support and intergenerational mentorship so we can move things along as opposed to simply relying on the mindsets of previous generations? Sustainable Ocean Alliance is also working in Indonesia. 25-year-old Dennis is helping restore fish populations by providing artificial coral reefs. 500 corals have been transplanted so far to the restoration sites. This also helps tourism in the Anambas Islands Marine Tourism Park. So it's interesting, your story starts as a student and now you are a professor. I um, am. Tell me about this experience. What's it been like? Absolutely. So I'm a professor at the Middlebury International Institute. And I'm teaching a class on the blue economy, entrepreneurship, and investment. And it's been so fascinating to be able to share all of my learnings and all of the downfalls and the exciting things that have happened with the students. It's really interesting. I had the opportunity to talk to one of the early astronauts who went on one of the moon missions. And I asked him, when you're up at night and you look at the moon, you must mm -hmm. see it differently than the rest of us. Mm -hmm. And I think of somebody who's as devoted as you are to the ocean. When you go to the ocean, you must see it differently than the rest of us. What, do you think more about it when you're sitting there or you do try and absorb the sun rays? I mean, how does it change you? The way I see the ocean, it's as if I have x-ray vision. I see the damage, I see the animals, but I also see the opportunity and the hope. And that's whenever I go to an ocean, I just absorb it all. And it just empowers me to want to do more and to continue this, this journey I'm on. A project in Guatemala is hoping to save the sources of water in the village of Cusaya. This is a community run entirely by indigenous Mayan Kachinko people. They are dedicated to protecting the environment and empowering the local community through ecological agriculture projects and training. The water of these rivers runs to the ocean. Do you find that a lot of people don't spend enough time thinking about the oceans? I mean, periodically we see the, the, the plastic straw stories here and there, and, and on occasion, uh, you and I had a chance to talk about the bleaching of coral reefs, but it doesn't seem like it's occupying as much space in the discussion. Do we need to be thinking about it more, talking about it more? We absolutely do. So the ocean is the most underrepresented of, of pillars in the climate space. When you think about it, we actually receive over 50% of the oxygen we breathe from our ocean. So every second breath you take comes from the ocean. And no matter where you live, whether it be within a coastal city or in a landlocked country, you still depend on the ocean for your livelihood. The ocean also is one of the biggest carbon sinks. So when you look at the problem with our greenhouse gases, the ocean is actually absorbing all of that carbon. And that's why the ocean is acidifying and the temperatures are changing. And so the dependency we have the ocean is so significant. And yet it's one of the most underfunded of the SDG goals by the UN. Um, so yes, I do believe that we need to put more attention to the ocean, become educated as to why the ocean needs to be protected, and also invest more capital in solutions in the ocean space. Getting back to what you talked about at the UN, Glasgow, uh, you know, we think about the Paris Climate Accord, uh, but more recently, COP26 Glasgow. When you look at these big events, and it always seems like it goes down to the last hour or two before they're able to wrangle some kind of, come out with some kind of statement or something. Are you still frustrated at what you're seeing or do you feel like there is movement or is it just kind of, is it moving too slow? I am very frustrated by the policy announcements that are being made. And the reason is because they all talk about the year 2050 or the year 2030 as when we need to reach milestones. But the reality is that no one is setting short-term goals and targets that they need to be held accountable for. And that's a problem because the people that are out there announcing these goals, they're not going to be in office by the year 2030 or 2050. And so I believe that we need to set lower, shorter timeframes in which we can reach these goals so that the people that are in office are held accountable and so that we can have the urgency um, uh, through which you know, we're seeing the world change. 
And that 12 year old that watched that documentary and the woman who's sitting across from me, can you trace enough of a trajectory that gives you hope or do you feel like we still need to be, you know, putting our foot on the pedal and, and pushing it as far as we can? I think we need to be hopeful. And the narrative needs to change because the reason why people don't talk about climate change or the ocean at this moment is because it's scary. It's depressing. And the way that I see the world is full of opportunity. We have the chance to build new companies. We have the chance to build new governmental structures that aren't restrictive or working in silos. And so I, I, I'm a big believer that the difference we can make is, is, is attainable. The only thing we have to do is just roll up our sleeves and, and truly act and do it, do it now. We'll leave on a hopeful note. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.